Well, good morning, folks, and welcome to Miyagi Mornings, episode 65, I believe it is today. Uh, once again, I'm answering a question off the MeWe post, so if you want to participate, the best way to do it, I think every single one this week came from MeWe, so get over to MeWe and, uh, you know, set up an account and then look me up and then friend me up and then right up at the top of my profile, you will see a post that is specifically for this. So today was an interesting one that I picked out. I think there's like 70 posts there now asking different questions. And I'm trying to keep a lot of variety. This one is definitely something we haven't really talked about on Miyagi Mornings anyway yet, though I've talked about it a bit on the podcast, on the Survival Podcast. It was a question about using water plants, specifically free-floating water plants, so something that just floats on the surface as feed for your livestock, which is a great idea. And something I'm going to be doing extensively this year using a plant called Water Hyacinth. I will also be using some other plants. Uh, but the question was, what would you use, water hyacinth or duckweed? Uh, given that I'm building this main feed-based system on water hyacinth, clearly the answer for me is water hyacinth. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's the only answer. And so I'm answering this question with, it depends. And uh, I'm going to give you actually three plants today. And whenever I do this and I, I start naming plants off that people have not heard of, they're like, how's that spelled? What did you say? You know, Okay, right down in the video notes. Each one of the plants is listed, and they are water hyacinth, okay, which is not really a hyacinth because it's a water plant and water hyacinth, but that's what they call it. Uh, then there is duckweed, which really quack quack duckweed, and then there is azola, which is a floating nitrogen fixing fern. All three of these are highly palatable to livestock, specifically things like poultry, ducks, and chickens, which a lot of you guys keep. I'm not really sure how rabbits um, and st such feel about duckweed and uh, water hyacinth and things like that uh, and azole, but I guess you could try and you could look it up and find out if anybody's done it. When it comes to water hyacinth, it seems to be the most versatile and I can't see how rabbits wouldn't eat it. Goats eat it, cattle eat it, pigs eat it, chickens eat it, gooses eat it. Um, I even saw one thing where a dude was feeding it to his guinea pigs, right? So, I mean, it's basically everything eats it. Now, the water hyacinth is a plant that floats and these kind of, it has stems that are kind of like bulbs of air. And then it has these big leaves that are about, you know, a couple inches round. And then these beautiful purple flowers that look like a lot like wild hyacinth, which is, I think, why they call it water hyacinth. It is also considered an invasive species in many states, including my own. And so in some places it's banned. So you might not use it if your state bans it and you don't have the risk tolerance for it. I'm, you know, maybe I have a little more risk tolerance than you. It seems to be of the three, the one with the highest potential. The dried leaf and stem has a protein content of about 33 to 38% with an average of about 35. This is equivalent to soybeans. Now this is, in, this is insane if you think about it. You have a plant with a protein uh, uh, percentage equivalent to soy that grows like a weed for free on the surface of water and slightly polluted slightly dirty water is even better it will grow faster and it loves heat now I know some people say oh my god you can destroy the universe Jack okay <laughs> Texas is a big state if I take Texas on the map and I pull it out like a puzzle piece and I put the t southern tip of Texas on the Red River, which for those not familiar with geography would be the northern border of Texas with Oklahoma, the, the top of Texas would then touch Canada. That's how big Texas is. I'm not bragging, I'm just making a geographical statement of fact. There are places in Texas where absolutely if water hyacinth gets into the native water systems, it can go completely mental and it will overwinter and it will become a, a problem. And guess what? All those places, it's already there. And there's also other plants like water lettuce that are doing the same thing. And the, the, the Department of Making You Sad goes nuts down there if anybody touches it and uses it for anything. Up here, we just had negative 2 degrees in the freaking lake that 60,000 acres froze over. It can't survive our winters. So treating an entire state the size of Texas like you have to go to the lowest common denominator doesn't make sense. If you want to ban this state of Texas, I think it should be banned by county. And then... At least it would make sense, even though that horse is out of the barn. So if you don't want to do that because your state says you're not allowed to and you do what the state says, 
And I can see in some instances, like if you have a commercial nursery and there's specters coming around, why you really would. Um, or you're in a place where you really do feel it could be a, a danger. And there are places it hasn't quite gotten to yet that could overwinter. And I, I wouldn't want to be the person who brought it there. But in our climate, northern climates, it works great. Azola, I don't know of any place that it is banned. And duckweed is native to the United States, so I don't know where the hell it would be banned. So you've got two other ones that can be used. Azola, I think, has about a 28% dry weight protein count, which is still really good, 24 to 28%. And duckweed is in the mid-30s, so it's also equivalent to soy. In my experience, all these people talking about duckweed doubles its size every day and you can just grow pounds and pounds. No, you can't. I grow the hell out of duckweed, and I find in some of my systems it does really, really well. and others, it kind of is lackadaisical. But if you start trying to save any, for your animals like in winter and you're out there harvesting it every time like every time it 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 fills up a space you take half you'll find that you might go a whole season and end up with a couple pounds by dry weight and it's not a bad thing it just isn't the volume that people seem to think that it is azola is not much better for that and i've never done it with water hyacinth so i'm not sure the thing about water hyacinth, even though it's got a lot of air in it and what have you, so do the other two, but it's a rather large plant. And if you own ducks, I'm, I'm not sure about geese, but I know that ducks, both Muscovies and your regular, you know, mallard-based ducks, which all your other ducks that you keep commercially are mallard-based. That's where they come from is the mallard. Um, will eat the roots and the stalks and the leaves. So as a duck owner... It is ideal for me. The other thing that water hyacinth does, in my opinion, better than azola and duckweed is it cleans water systems. So there's been research done where they've taken commercial duck operations and they run the duck wastewater, which is sewage basically, through lagoons that they fill with water hyacinth. And then they measure the out the water that leaches out and it's cleaner than commercial uh, restorative systems by going through the natural process. The water hyacinth is, it, it, you have to have enough to balance against your ducks. But the water hyacinth is such a nutrient um, removing plant that it does a better job than like commercial sewage. And then if it then goes into some sort of riparian tree based system, all it does is it's fertilizer for trees. That's exactly how I'm going to be using it. And because the ducks eat the roots, it's a much larger yield that you can get for feed for your animals. The other side of it is all of these can be composted and all of these can be used as direct mulches. They're high in nutrients and they're, depending on the water they're in and what's being run through that water, they're also fairly high in minerals. Now obviously a plant cannot have a mineral in it that isn't in the water that it's growing or the soil that's growing in. But when, you, when you're running a fish-based system and you're feeding fish feed, there's a lot of minerals in those um, fish pellets because that, that fish pellet is made up somewhat of fish meal, usually from oceanic fish. So now you're talking about bone, blood, all this fish waste product, plus you're talking about oceanic, so you're talking about an animal that's lived in the mineral-rich sea. So now you're recycling that nutrient into your compost or into your mulch. And, and to me, that's very exciting as well. And you can do this with all of them. And let's talk about what each one does well and what each one doesn't do well. Water hyacinth grows really fast. When it gets hot out, it barely moves until it gets hot out. It also dies when it goes below freezing. And I mean it dies hard. Bruce Willis level die hard. So if you want to stay self-sufficient in it, you need some sort of indoor tank with some overhead lighting, and you need to bring it in, at least a few plants, to overwinter out of the cold. That's actually a good thing, because if you are environmentally conscious, which I am, and you don't want to be the person that brings an invasive species in, as long as you're in a place where you get a good hard freeze every year, it ain't going to happen. I don't care what your department of making your sad says. It is a large plant. And if you're feeding it to animals that don't eat the roots, you may have to remove the roots here and the plant there. Though I don't see any reason to do that. I would put it into a compost heap, let the animals take what they want, which is precisely what I'm going to do. Mine are just going to take some roots. If you wanted something that you 
we're going to chop up and dry and save over winter, I think water hyacinth is the best product. It's, be, it's being done all over Africa right now to reduce the cost of poultry feeds. And these are just guys going out with like little barges they, they hand build and, and pitchforks and pulling these out of these lakes that are, that are being literally screwed up hardcore. Let, don't get me wrong, the pl this plant in a place it doesn't belong can cause a problem. That's why like if you live in South Texas, I wouldn't recommend you play with it. First of all, they're gonna come get you probably sooner or later, somebody rats you out. And two, you actually can make the problem worse. Again, you get up above the, the latitude where you get hard freezes and it's just not a problem. It's just not a problem. Then the other side of it, like I said, there are places where yeah, it can be a problem, but it already is. And you growing some in a tank in your backyard ain't gonna change it. Now what you could do is go harvest out of the wild and if somebody asks you what you're doing, you could say, well, I'm trying to help, right? I'm not propagating it, I'm destroying it. So that would require actually mechanically destroying it. I think that might cover your ass. You might wanna check with your local officials on that. Um, now, azola. Azola is kind of in the middle here. It's a much larger plant than duckweed. Duckweed is not the smallest, but it's one of the smallest flowering plants in the world. Actually, little tiny flowers hard to see but they're there and uh, but azola is a fern and it grows more lily pad like and little fronds all over it and on its little roots that dangle down it fixes nitrogen so it's a really great plant not only is it palatable to livestock specifically ducks love it it also since it fixes nitrogen it's a high nitrogen mulch so simply by removing it and putting it in your garden beds, you are adding nitrogen to your beds and all the minerals and other things go along with it. And it also is a great compost activator. My least favorite among these, and I still like it, is duckweed. Duckweed is, um, it, it's just very, very small. Now, the way I use duckweed, I have a couple of my metal tanks that I use duckweed in them. Water comes up from a lower tank, overflows these three top metal tanks, goes down to a center tank and down to the bottom. And I keep duckweed in the top three, and they're three of the oval six foot by two foot galvanized steel stock tanks. One of them, it doesn't grow worth a damn it. The other two, it grows crazy and like, it'll form a mat like a couple inches thick. And all summer long, when it's growing really, really well up there, I just have a standard size kind of like strainer, like a little hand one with a little fine mesh in it like you'd use to strain noodles or something in the kitchen and I just keep it out there and it hangs on the inside of my facade so it's just out of the way and I don't lose it and I just go through and I just take one big scoop and wherever I put the duck pools that day one of those pools I just drop it in there and they love it and it's a supplement but it, I don't think it really reduces my feed bill by much my new system that I'm putting in is going to have an in-ground pond that's going to be just a few inches raised above grade to grow water hyacinth. People are like, the ducks are gonna eat it all. You'll no, they can't get there. Just relax, I know what I'm doing. Been doing this a while. And uh, it's also gonna have three other, about four foot square, 20 inch deep tanks. Those tanks are gonna primarily grow crayfish, which are feedstock for my other uh, systems. The top of those tanks will have a layer of azola if it does well. And I think it will because we'll be running duck wastewater through that system and that should do really well. The truth is you can use any of these plants. Livestock love them. And what you're doing is an awful lot, like just yesterday I featured kelp meal, I'm sorry, liquid kelp is a, is a soil amendment on the podcast. And it has 60 to 70 uh, minerals in it, depending on the source of the kelp, whether it's like Norwegian or Pacific or whatever kelp. You will not get that in a freshwater aquatic system. Obviously salt water has salt in it and salt right in the real world before we refine it is made up of almost all the trace minerals there's just very very small amounts but plants take what they want and a plant in suspension in water can take anything out of that water it wants so it concentrates some of those those minerals in it and that's how you can then use kelp and get so much bang for your buck on your plants like I said, you're not gonna have the incredibly diverse and, and, and highly available uh, bioavailable minerals in a freshwater system that you do in a saltwater system. But it's about, it's like second best. So when you're using these plants, not only are you getting a nitrogen kick, not only are you getting a compostable, not only are you getting a feed, not only are you getting protein, you're getting a mineralized infusion that is highly available to your other plants. So to me, it makes sense for all three purposes, no matter which of these plants you, you decide. 
actually four. Cause, and I like to try to come up with even more functions, and I bet I could if I tried. I like to have five functions for every element that I have in my designs. But definitely your top ones here are a mulch that gives a nitrogen kick and a mineral kick. A compostable, a compost activator, because these things are very good at activating it. So you put a big handful of this in the center of your compost pile. You got a compost activator. All right. A livestock feed. I mean, and, and the ability to clean wastewater. So I think that they, they, they're beautiful for all that. And they also function as a fish feed. Nothing I know of eats water hyacinth, but koi and goldfish will keep the roots pruned back, so they're eating that. Um, duckweed, I can tell you, duckweed, uh, goldfish, and koi eat the hell out of it. So if you're running systems with those in it, now you have another feedstock. I'm not sure on a Zola. I only ever grew it once. It didn't overwinter, and I didn't do much with it. I'm going to play with it this year. And if it doesn't work in that system with the crayfish, I'll bring duckweed over there. In fact, what I'll probably do is like a Zola in one, and, or Zola in two, and duckweed in the third one, since it's already there. And uh, anyway, this is a good question, and we need to start thinking this way, and I want to finish with, I know it's a long one, but I want to finish with why. We need to start thinking this way because we need to become more self-reliant in our ability to feed not just us, but our animals. If we're buying 100% of the feed that our ducks and chickens and rabbits and pigs and everything eat, then all we're doing is converting low-end grain into high-end meat. And that's much better than going to the store and buying it. But if we really want to start building our self-sufficiency, which we measure in percentage, right? Self-reliance we measure in time. If you can go three weeks without electricity because you have a generator enough fuel, you're self-reliant for three weeks. But self-reliance is a time-based equation. Self-sufficiency is a percentile game. And if you can get 50% of the feed for your livestock from your own land, then you're 50% self-sufficient infinitely. And that's the game that we need to be playing. So I enjoyed this question. I know it's a long one for Miyagi Mornings, but I hope you enjoyed the answer. That wraps up the week. And remember, you can always catch the Miyagi Mornings Weekly Recap. It goes out on Saturday mornings. iTunes, Stitcher, all that, and listen to it in audio instead of seeing my shiny face here on the video. Take care, guys.